do great work and, and do great work and have the courage to sell it and force it to be so and force it to be sold. You can't just have talent. I mean, it, it, you know, I did a book called uh, uh, Damn Good Advice for People with Talent. It, it's not enough to have talent. You have to have the courage to not let anybody force you to ever do a, a, a job that, isn't, that you don't think is great. And people say to me, yeah, but they can't do that because, you know, sometimes, you know, you, 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 you don't want to throw a client out. You know, it's uh, people's jobs, blah, blah, I said, uh, you know, you, you, know, you got to keep your job. You just, you just proved to me that you'll never be great. The minute you start doing bad work because it's forced on you, you, know, you ain't shit. You have to have the courage to fight for your work, you know? The high point of your career? Uh, I don't know, everybody says that uh, it was, uh, I, I don't know, everybody says it's when I started PKL, but uh, uh, I think in the uh, in the 80s, the whole uh, the whole year, uh, the, a decade of the 80s, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, had an article in the 10 greatest marketing miracles of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the decade, and I had six of them. You know, uh, you know, it was like, huh? huh? You know. And okay, of those. Of those six, or, or, or anything else that you've done, what's your single best piece of work? <sighs> Any, meeny, miny, mo. Uh, um, when you lay, you, you, when well, you lay you know, awake at night, what do you go back to and think? Well, a huh. thing like uh, MTV, everybody, it, it was incredibly, MTV back then was, a, was great, except there was one problem. They uh, were broadcasting to nobody. In 1982, uh, they called me in, they said, uh, you know, we're probably going to close this down. We don't have one cable operator in the country. Huh? And they were broadcasting to nobody. And uh, so I, uh, I, I said, uh, well, okay, uh, uh, I, I, I had done a campaign. For, uh, I said, remember you, a young, and they're all young punks, 25, 26, 20. Uh, remember you guys made me when you were eight, nine years old? I did a campaign. I, I want my, uh, you know, I want my Mapo. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had Mickey Mantle's, you know, a, a great band. Mickey Mantle, I want my maple. You know, Oscar, I want my maple. Uh, he said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, well, now you fuckers are all going to be yelling, I want my MTV. <laughs> you know, that new way. And, and, I, and I was going, I'm going to do a commercial. Blah, 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 and at a certain point, the voiceover says, if you don't get MTV where you live, pick up the phone and dial your local cable operator and say, and I said, I'll cut to a guy like Mick Jagger who will pick up the phone and say, I want my MTV. And they looked at me like I didn't know shit. And they, I said, what's the matter? I said, we couldn't get it. We've been trying to get a rock star for, the, for, the, for two years, they won't come near us. Everybody in a, in a rock, in a, a, a music business thinks that MTV would destroy, you know, like radio was gonna destroy uh, 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 music. Uh, and George, George, go back and come back with another campaign. I, I was walking back to the agency, I said, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get fucking Big Jagger. You know? <laughs> and that's what's great about, you know, when you get ideas and you say, how, how are you gonna get somebody, how are you gonna do something? You know what, you could do it somehow, somehow. How am I doing? Oh, Bill Graham, he was a great uh, rock producer. I had worked with him, uh, uh, at, with Bob Dylan, because when Bob Dylan did a, a Hurricane song and helped me get moved with Hurricane Carter out of jail. Anyway, Just so. a little background, we're back now to the film. So I called, so I called him, I called him. We're, we're, we're coming right out of the 1960s. So I called him and I asked him, uh, about it, and he said, okay, he gave me Big Jagger's phone number, five o'clock, 10 o'clock, London. I called him, I get him on the phone. I'm talking my ass off. Mick, you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went on for about five minutes, and finally he said, I said, well, what do you think? He says, I'll be in New York on Monday. And he came, and he brought Pat Benatar and Peter Townsend with him. We shot the commercials. A week later, I ran them in the San Francisco, 5.30, uh, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, 1, 2, 3 in the morning. 5.30 San Francisco time, 8.30 New York time, the cable operator calls there, and he gets Pittman on the phone. He said, Pittman, get that fucking commercial off the air. And Pittman said, oh, I'll take it off right away. He said, by the way, I'll take it. He said, what do you mean you'll take it? I'll take MTV. Why? Because I'm getting millions of phone calls. And we went through, and we went through America, you know, uh, and in two months, the whole country had it, you know. The point is, you can, 
great advertising can create marketing miracles. Uh, Lee. High, well, high point of your career and best work. Yeah, well, you know, talk about marketing miracles, talk about cultural miracles. I, we got to be part of one of the most amazing cultural, digital, all, all things revolution in the history of the world, working with Steve Jobs and Apple Computer, first in the early days. And, and then when Steve came back and was trying to save a company that was almost out of business, uh, but it was this love of his life and this brand that he cared so much about. And he believed and knew and understood that someday technology was going to be in our pocket and be in our backpack and we were going to have it accessible 24 hours a day and use it like we do today. He knew that when he was 25 years old. So somehow we got to ride that bus. But in that whole uh, so I, w I worked with Steve both times he was there, but the moment in time that I'll never forget is when we produced the Think Different commercial and the Think Different campaign and gave new voice and new energy back to the Apple company and gave permission for all their designers to go do the amazing stuff that they ended up doing. Just as a... As a <laughs> as a point of, of, of history, the first meetings with with Jobs, the first time you pitched to him. Um, when was it, what was that like? Yeah, well that was 80, you know, and he had the Apple II, and he was, he, was, he, was just, he was just as adamant that the box that he had on the table today was the thing that was gonna change the world even though it wasn't quite there yet. He was just as adamant then as he was, you know, uh, his whole life about what the technology was about. And he was the smartest guy I ever knew in terms of his ability to kind of absorb and understand anything that was being discussed, whether as you watch the music business, not just technology, the phone business. But when you'd sit down and talk about advertising, he had opinions from day one. 25 years old, and he already could tell me about Sony brand and Polaroid and the ads that Doyle Dane Burnback did. He loved marketing, he loved that. So it was like immediately challenging me to do some great ads for him. Uh, you know, even though the technology wasn't even understood by the world yet. What, what was the meeting like? Do you remember? Can you sketch it out? Who was in it? It was, uh, Jay took me up to meet Steve and this guy Regis McKenna who, who uh, was working with Steve at the time. And Steve is kind of quick study, sit, sits down, all right, so who's this guy? I started, you know, kind of explaining what I was going to do and it was, it was a small, kind of confrontation, is this guy good enough to be in the room, kind of meeting with Steve, and somehow he decided I got to be in the room, and uh, it was pretty exciting not having to leave the room, at least when Steve was in. <laughs>